Working women, children and pay. New research finds mothers can earn up to a third less than their male counterparts. The wage gap widens for mothers returning to work. The study says it's partly due to a lack of promotion in part-time jobs. Women struggle with the issue of having to be perfect mothers at home and then having to be perfect in their career. I've taken a pay cut because I've changed my career and I've changed my hours. So I don't think that's a gender issue. It's my choice. We'll be asking what more employers and the government could do to narrow the pay gap for working mothers also tonight. After Jeremy Corbyn is filmed complaining about overcrowding on trains, CCTV emerges appearing to contradict his story. A triumphant return for Team GB as Britain's most successful Olympic team in more than a century arrive back at Heathrow with their record-breaking medal haul. More than 300 athletes and staff flew in on a special plane from Rio with double Olympic champion Max Whitlock providing some of the entertainment. The risk of developing breast cancer is higher than previously thought for women who take HRT, says new research. And we reveal the film that's been voted the best movie of the 21st century by almost 200 critics from around the world. In the South, as the badger cull widens, divisions in Dorset over how best to tackle bovine TB. And an accident, the fire that destroyed the school was most likely caused by a workman. Good evening. There are calls for more to be done to shrink the pay gap between men and women after new research found that working mothers fall further behind their male counterparts. The study from the Institute for Fiscal Studies found that women who have children can be paid up to a third less than men by the time their first child is 12. It says mothers who return to work can be held back by a lack of promotion in part-time jobs. Here's our economics editor, Kamal Ahmed. The ups and major downs of the gender wage gap. Yes, it has been reducing overall, but for mothers and graduates, there is still a significant pay penalty. In this London park, opinions were clear. Having children presented major career challenges, ones that men often steer well clear of. Women struggle with the issue of having to be perfect mothers at home and then having to be perfect in their career. I've taken a pay cut because I've changed my career and I've changed my hours. So. I don't think that's a gender issue, it's my choice. The gender wage gap has been declining. In 1993, there was a 28% difference in the hourly income of men and women. That has now fallen to 18%. But there are significant variations. For mothers, the wage gap grows to 33% by the time the first child reaches 12 years old. One of the key areas to look at here is what happens when women reduce their hours of paid work. For whatever reason, at that point, a lot of them find that wage progression shuts down. Now, that could be because they are genuinely not uh, gathering the skills and experience that employers value in those kinds of jobs. It could be something to do with some form of discrimination or power that employers are exercising over those women in holding down their wages. She is showing them the correct way to polish. The workplace has certainly changed since the 1940s, but the persistent wage gap is still with us. Before a family arrives, there is already a 10% difference in income. Some people argue that at least part of the gender pay gap is down to choice, mothers making the decision to leave work to look after their children. But although that may partially be true, is it really a choice when childcare is so prohibitively expensive for many? Is it really a choice when flexible working is not valued as highly by many businesses as traditional nine to five working? And is it really a choice when mothers return to work that they miss out on future promotions? We have about 750 employees of which about 70% are women. Laura Tennyson runs a mother and child clothing firm. She encourages employees, men and women to work flexible hours and welcomes parents back to the office. If you have been a full-time parent or been working in a less demanding job for a few years whilst your children are young, you've still got a huge amount to offer. And I'm very keen on employing people who've had their babies and are keen to come back into the workforce and really progress. The government has pledged to act, the new Prime Minister making it one of the key tests of her time in office. 
That means fighting against the burning injustice. If you're a woman, you will earn less than a man. Businesses will be forced to publish the pay rates for men and women. More shared parental leave is available. But end the pay gap in a generation, as the government once pledged. That lofty target is still a long way from being hit. And Kamal is with me now. We heard the new Prime Minister there. What more can the government do to close the gender pay gap? Well, absolutely, Sophie. Uh, the Prime Minister, who returns from holiday tomorrow, has certainly set herself a stiff target. This is a stubborn issue, not just for mothers, but for all workers. The gap in general between men and women is 18% in terms of their income. They've really set them, given themselves two policy tools. The first one is the publication of the gender wage gap for by businesses. I think that that will lead to some action. Businesses would be embarrassed by a large gap and will take action on that. Secondly, they have offered much more shared parental leave. But the take-up by fathers, frankly, is pretty miserable. Less than 1%, some suggest, of fathers actually take the extended leave they have now been offered by the government. Ranged against the government are some big, big obstacles. Firstly, in-work benefit cuts tend to disproportionately affect women, makes it harder for them to come back into work. Also, the public sector is shrinking, the private sector is growing, the wage gap in the private sector is far larger than the public sector, and finally, the cost of childcare. It now costs a third more to send your child to nursery than it did five years ago. So Theresa May knows she's got a massive challenge ahead. It will be the autumn statement when I think we'll see the first evidence of whether they're going to really and how they're going to tackle this issue. Come on. Thank you. Virgin Trains is challenging footage showing the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn sitting on the floor of what he called a ram-packed service because he couldn't find a seat. The train company has released CCTV footage of Mr Corbyn on the London to Newcastle train earlier this month, which appears to contradict his claims. Our political correspondent Ben Wright reports. Crouching on the floor of a Virgin train, this was Jeremy Corbyn's claim. Today this train is completely ram-packed. The staff on the train are absolutely brilliant, working really hard to help everybody. The reality is there's not enough trains. We need more of them. And they're also incredibly expensive. Isn't that a good case for public ownership? The video was recorded on the 11 a.m. departure from London to Newcastle on August the 11th. Days later, Mr Corbyn's filmed corridor complaint was released. But now Virgin Trains has hit back. Releasing CCTV pictures, the company says, shows there were seats available. According to Virgin Trains, seven minutes into the journey, Jeremy Corbyn walked past several unreserved seats in Coach H. He also walked past a number of reserved but empty seats a minute later. Then at 11.43, Mr Corbyn returned to Coach H with the help of onboard crew and took a seat. The train guard relocated two passengers to first class so Mr Corbyn's group could sit together. But that was after Mr Corbyn had walked to the end of the train, sat on the floor and recorded his video. In a statement from Virgin Trains tweeted by Richard Branson, the company said, We have to take issue with the idea that Mr Corbyn wasn't able to be seated on the service, as this clearly wasn't the case. We'd encourage Jeremy to book ahead next time he travels with us. The company says it knows it can be hard to find seats on some of its East and West Coast services, and Jeremy Corbyn is not the first commuter to complain of overcrowding. But it's the suggestion he was deceptive to make a political point that could be damaging. Jeremy Corbyn, champion of a nationalised railway, is being taken to task by a private train operator. But Mr Corbyn's team insists it's Virgin Trains who've got this wrong and that when they first boarded the train, there were no free unreserved seats available. So they, like other passengers, had to wait for some to become free. This was, they said, a ram-packed train. What you can't see on the images necessarily is the fact that there was luggage reserving the seats or, you know, small children who you might not be able to see over the back of the seat that was sitting there. There's simply, you know, I was there, there was simply no seats available on the train. That's why Jeremy sat on the floor for the first part of the journey. Earlier this evening, Mr Corbyn's usual garden gate politeness was missing. Thank you very much for invading my private space. His irritation at this scrutiny clear. Um, some of you might have seen on social media today, there's been a little bit of a spat. Mr. Branson has decided he's very upset. About and at a rally later, Mr. Corbyn's campaign chief hit back at Virgin Trains, accusing Sir Richard Branson of having a pop 
at the Labour leader because of his plans to renationalise the railways. Mr Corbyn's leadership rival Owen Smith tried to make mileage out of this train row, saying his own campaign remained on track. So why does this pretty remarkable row matter? Well, central to Jeremy Corbyn's pitch is that he's straight, principled and unspun. And a spat that brings his character into question risks political harm, which is why his team have been desperate to quash Virgin Trains' version of events. But the company, of course, has its reputation to protect. And tonight remain emphatic that Jeremy Corbyn clearly walked past empty, unreserved seats when he got on that train. So will this damage Mr Corbyn? Well, I think it's unlikely. In fact, it's the sort of skirmish that will only energise his supporters. Ben, thank you. Team GB arrived home to a hero's welcome this morning. They touched down at Heathrow, carrying their record-breaking medal haul from the Rio Olympics. 67 medals in all, 27 of them gold, the most Team GB have won since 1908. The boxer Nicola Adams and gymnast Max Whitlock, both Olympic champions, were first off the plane from Brazil, which was given the special number BA 2016 and a newly painted gold nose cone. Our sports correspondent Katie Gornell watched them arrive home. Just a warning, not surprisingly, there is some flash photography. It arrived carrying a haul of precious metal from Rio, the plane they renamed Victorious in honour of Team GB. The games may be over, but on board the Olympic party had continued. The 11-hour flight, plenty of time to celebrate. And plenty of time for Max Whitlock to show off some of the skills that brought him double gold. These are moments to cherish for Team GB. They are a team that took on the world and won. You sense this is going to take a while to sink in for Britain's athletes. They return home having made history in Rio, a record 67 medals, two more than London 2012, and a success that has created a whole host of new stars. <laughs> After winning the hearts of the country today, they return to their loved ones. And there was much to catch up on. That is, once they'd found the right bag. Team Colours had made that a little tricky. On social media, we could feel how much support there was. But it's not until you get back here how much, how much we really had. So it's good to be here. Adam Peaty takes Olympic gold for Great Britain. It was a superb team performance sparked by one man, Adam Peaty. Oh, my goodness me, 57... The swimmer who won Britain's first medal of the Games and in some style. He told me today that he's still coming to terms with all he's achieved. I can't really put it into words how, you know, how much that meant to me to actually get the first medal and you know, do the world record and uh, you know, achieve my childhood dream. Um, you know, to give that kind of momentum to the rest of the team is completely priceless and um, you know, that's something I'll remember forever and you know, hopefully we can do exactly the same in Tokyo which will be, again, uh, amazing, hopefully an amazing Games. Even for more experienced heads, it was an Olympics of firsts. Catherine Granger won silver to become the first British woman to claim five medals in separate games. But this one for the team as a whole was special. That excitement you could feel, it was so tangible that suddenly people were like, this performance will make a difference to the whole nation. Um, and I think, I think for that reason, because it was probably more unexpected and because it was it was a challenge that no nation has ever done. And we finished second on the medal table, sort of sandwiched between the superpowers of USA and China. You think, it's hard to argue that's not our best games ever. For many of these returning athletes, their lives will be changed forever by their success in Rio. Although some things are more precious than gold. Katie Gornall, BBC News. A brief look at some of the day's other news stories now and a soldier has died after being shot at a military training area in Northumberland. The man from the Royal Regiment of Scotland was involved in a night exercise using live ammunition at the Otterburn training area. Police and the Ministry of Defence are investigating what happened. A jury has been told how a British imam was murdered by two supporters of so-called Islamic State because they considered his practice of healing black magic. 71-year-old Jalal Udin died from head injuries in an attack at a children's play area in Rochdale. The chairman of Ofsted, the education watchdog in England, David Hoare, has announced his resignation. 
Earlier this month, Mr Hoare apologised after calling the Isle of Wight a poor ghetto that suffered from inbreeding. The MP for the Isle of Wight said Mr Hoare's comments had been inaccurate, insulting and extremely unhelpful. New research suggests the risk of developing breast cancer increases more than previously thought for women who take combined hormone replacement therapy. A study of almost 40,000 women found the risk increased the longer the drugs were used, but the risk level returned to normal when the HRT ended. Here's our medical correspondent, Fergus Walsh. One million women in the UK are taking HRT, either in tablets, gels or patches, like Louise Newsom, to counter the often debilitating symptoms of the menopause, such as hot flushes, mood swings and insomnia. A GP, she runs a menopause clinic, and for her the benefits greatly outweigh the risks. I couldn't function with my menopausal symptoms. I was really horrified how tired I felt, how I was unable to concentrate. I kept saying to my husband, I just feel like I've been drugged. I need to go to bed. I've got so much work to do. What am I going to do? And I just didn't even understand or realise that it was the menopause causing these symptoms. Taking any medication is a balance between risk and benefit. But for HRT, the evidence keeps shifting. This research suggests that for every thousand women aged 50 to 54 who are not on HRT or are taking oestrogen only, there'll be 14 cases of breast cancer over five years. But for every thousand taking combined HRT, that would rise to 34 cases of breast cancer in the same period. Now, that increased risk returns to normal after stopping HRT. HRT also slightly increases the risk of ovarian cancer. But it's worth pointing out that lifestyle factors, such as being overweight and especially smoking, carry a much greater risk of many cancers and premature death. I don't think women should suffer in silence. I think it's important to go and take some advice, talk to your GP and you know, talk to your friends as well, get some support. I think um, it, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's the menopause, I've just got to put up with it. Actually. Um, there's a lot that you can do to minimise the impact. Last year, the health watchdog NICE said HRT should not simply be dismissed because of the risks. Women using the drugs are normally advised to take the lowest effective dose for the shortest possible time. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. The result of the US presidential election in November is likely to have a far-reaching effect on the future of America's energy policy. Donald Trump says global warming isn't worth worrying about. He has pledged to revive the coal industry. But Hillary Clinton is warning that climate change is one of the most serious threats facing the world. She wants the US to invest more in renewable power. Our science editor David Shookman reports from Ohio. On the Ohio River, a vast fleet of barges laden with coal. Part of a massive industry that's powered the American economy for more than a hundred years. But as I visit this sprawling complex, coal is now caught up in the battle for the White House. Put simply, Donald Trump supports it, Hillary Clinton does not. The coal mines here are like underground cities stretching for miles. But because of tough pollution controls and cheaper shale gas, dozens of mining companies have filed for bankruptcy. Donald Trump offers them the prospect of revival. We catch the end of a shift. By the end of the year, this mine will close. The miners blame environmentalists and President Obama's actions on climate change. And one leading mine owner, a Trump supporter, tells me real damage has been done. When two coal miners get laid off, if they own anything, it's their homes. And when they get laid off, they have no one to sell that home to. So those people that just want to work in honor and dignity are denied that. And it's not the America that I cherish. That's why I speak out like I do. That's why I say Obama is a greater scourge than America has ever had in its history. The problem with coal comes when you burn it. It releases carbon dioxide, which is blamed for global warming. Donald Trump says that isn't a problem, but Hillary Clinton says it is, and she's offering a greener future instead. In another corner of Ohio, a clean way of generating power. At this local company, First Solar, robots and people 
churn out a solar panel every single second. A new industry is rising as an older one declines. While the debate rages over whether climate change is a threat or not, there's been an incredibly rapid industrial transformation so that a factory like this one is now producing solar panels that have tumbled in price. It means that solar power can be roughly comparable in cost to power produced by coal. So whoever wins the American presidential election, low carbon power may make sense anyway. There are solar panels at the Museum of Art in Toledo and at the city's zoo. Renewable energy is becoming more of a feature of everyday life here. And great arrays like this one covering entire fields are no longer so unusual. Panel by panel, America is becoming greener without many people even realizing. I just think we have some politicians that are fighting the last war. Uh, they're fighting uh, over something, you know, they still believe solar is somewhere out there in the future. It's here now. And uh, we've probably passed the tipping point or the turning point, and they just don't know it yet. All this matters because America is the world's largest economy, and its decisions on energy could boost or undermine international action on global warming under the Paris Climate Agreement. Donald Trump says he'll pull America out of it. Hillary Clinton supports it. So a great deal hangs on the outcome of this election. David Shukman, BBC News in Ohio. The BBC has learned that a controversial badger cull in England is to be extended to five new areas to try to stop bovine tuberculosis spreading to cattle herds. At present, the mass shooting of badgers has been restricted to parts of Somerset, Gloucestershire and Dorset, but it's understood it will be extended to Devon, Cornwall and Herefordshire next month. The new mayor of South Africa's largest city, Johannesburg, has promised to restore dignity to its people after the African National Congress lost political control for the first time since the end of apartheid. The ANC remains the largest party but lost its overall majority in elections earlier this month, losing key cities to the opposition party, the Democratic Alliance. Our correspondent Milton Mikosi reports. Celebrations where once the ANC colours flew high. Now it's the blue of the opposition party here, the Democratic Alliance. The most symbolic loss for the ANC is in Johannesburg, the country's economic hub. Hemen Mashaba is a black candidate for a party that was traditionally seen as the white opposition. People appreciate uh, the role that uh, ANC played uh, within the liberation struggles of our country. That is something that all of us, including myself, we cannot ignore. However, that does not give anybody the right to steal openly, steal public money, looting it. Actually, Jacob Zuma and the ANC government were blatantly looting this country and they thought they could get away with it. And people of South Africa said, enough, it's enough. The DA did not win an outright majority, but through a coalition of smaller parties against the ANC, it won major victories. This is still a significant moment for a democracy that is 22 years young. In 1994, it was a different atmosphere here in Johannesburg. It was a time of liberation and people were elated, excited, and they were full of hope. This election is something different since then. I've covered the elections since that time, the end of apartheid. And many people have told us that they have voted against the ANC because of a litany of corruption scandals associated with it. And some have said it was President Jacob Zuma's own style of leadership that they've called into question. There was promise of, uh, I think, free education for more than 18 years now. So, like, people really think that now it's time for change. And maybe going in a new direction will help. Whatever they do, they always refer to apartheid, which is, I think now is more than 20 years away from apartheid. Some of the guys, even me, I'm 26, I never experienced apartheid. So when you talk about, about apartheid, I don't know what you're talking about. So people, they kind of, like, lose hope in ANC in that format. The ANC is in decline, but it still commands significant support. It is, after all, the party of Nelson Mandela. But the legacy of liberation might not last forever. Milton Nkosi, BBC News, 
in Johannesburg. When the new Prime Minister returns to work after the summer recess, her in-tray is likely to be rather full. This week, we'll be looking at some of the issues Theresa May could be dealing with. In the first of our series of big decisions facing Mrs May, our Wales correspondent Howard Griffith has been taking a look at the struggling steel industry. Steel is the spine that's held Port Talbot together. For over a century, these works have brought the best paid jobs, security for every new generation, but no more. <coughs> David's young son has been born at a time of turmoil in the industry. A few weeks before his birth, the steelworks were put up for sale. Tata then put that sale on hold. David doesn't really know what that means for his job there, or what the next months will bring. The morale in work is, I've never seen it so bad. I mean, there's, there's less people there. You're working harder than you've ever worked before. Uh, you don't know if you're going to have a job in a month's time. Um, we don't know in six months whether we'll be able to afford pay the bills and keep the mortgage and still live. In the heat of the crisis earlier this year, David Cameron's government pledged a support package costing hundreds of millions of pounds. That could involve loans or even part nationalisation by the government. On energy, it said it would look at trying to reduce electricity prices. And it also offered a landmark change in pensions law, lowering the benefits paid to workers. But since those promises were made, the landscape has changed. The Brexit vote has made the long-term future less certain. But the immediate collapse of sterling has made this place more competitive. Steel prices have improved and Tata have had a rethink about selling. Now they're talking about a potential merger with one of their rivals. Some argue it's an opportunity for Theresa May to change course completely and not be bound by her predecessor's pledges. If there's a role for government at all, it's not to prop up something that can't stand on its own two feet. It would be to help the families and the local community in that area relocate or retrain if the worst comes to the worst. That and no more. But on the streets of Port Talbot, they want intervention. And insiders suggest Theresa May is prepared to go even further to secure steelmaking stays in the UK. This will be about securing Britain's key commodities, key products, key manufacturing industries and how we can help strengthen those and take them forward in the future. So I think there will be you know, a situation in which ministers will be encouraged to leave absolutely no stone unturned, think the unthinkable. David knows that decisions made in Downing Street may decide the fate of his industry. His future rests partly in the Prime Minister's hands. Howard Griffith, BBC News, Port Talbot. Sir Anthony Jay, the co-writer of the BBC political comedies Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, has died after a long illness. He was 86. Sir Anthony was a founding member of the BBC Tonight team before going on to script documentaries such as Royal Family and Elizabeth R, A Year in the Life of a Queen. Can you name your favourite film of the 21st century? Almost 200 critics from around the world have been asked by the BBC to come up with the best 100 films of the recent past. And the results may surprise you. Our entertainment, entertainment correspondent David Silito has been taking a look at the list. Mulholland Drive, the best film of the 21st century, according to a poll of critics. Surreal, mysterious, utterly baffling. This is a masterpiece of surrealist endeavour. Imagination. Genius. Critic Nick James first saw it 15 years ago, and while it wouldn't be his number one, it would be close. His favourite is actually number two, one car weighs in the mood for love. It's a visual extravaganza that's full of emotion. The brief encounter of our time. The brief encounter of our time, indeed. And um, there's nothing to touch it. Wall-E is one of five animations on the list, but there's no Ken Loach, no Mike Lee. But Richard Linklater appears twice. So, 
is this a golden age of cinema? Because a lot of talent has recently left for television. Nick James thinks the problem isn't a shortage of films, but a glut. In 2001, around 340 movies were released. 15 years on, is getting on for 800. I think the market is flooded with too many films and that that may lead to just a difficulty of reception of finding where the great stuff is. But they have found a clear winner, a film about an amnesiac actress, the subconscious and... Do you get it? I think that I receive everything that David Lynch would like me to receive Do you from get it? Mulholland Drive. I don't think that's a sensible question. So, even the critics find it baffling, but they still consider it to be the century's masterpiece so far. David Silito, BBC News. Newsnight is coming up on BBC Two. Here's Evan. As we all come down from the Olympics, we're meant to enjoy the Paralympics starting in a fortnight. Except this year, Rio seems to be making rather a mess of them. We'll ask how far off track they are. Join me now on BBC Two. Here on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Good night. <laughs>